So till they get fired, I'll uh, get going. Uh, so I think uh, we have a great uh, platform that uh, Tyler, Paul, and John created uh, by uh, talking about the uh, integration um, and then the uh, agility and then the integration agility because uh, what we did during last two decades like using different um, architecture patterns like service orientation, um, uh, even driven architecture, even latest microservices that we created, a lot of endpoints. Uh, so that's where the integration is very important. Uh, what we are doing with application development is calling these different endpoints and building applications. Then again, like we were looking at the agility and then every organization trying to be agile, but uh, it's not true agile because of these different kind of uh, bottlenecks and gates that we have to go through when it comes to end-to-end -end application development. Uh, so uh, I think it's a uh, good topic to discuss, so that's why we thought of have an open discussion with some uh, industry leads uh, who is working on uh, different stages of the projects and uh, trying to build agile teams and then make the organizations um, uh, agile. So uh, to start, um, uh, why don't you uh, give an introduction about um, your organization and the projects that you are working on, as well as your contribution to this agile transformation uh, to start the discussion. Probably, Gautam, you can start. Sure. Um, so uh, thanks, Asamka. Um, I'm Gautam Palapa. I lead systems and platforms. Um, I'm a vice president of global technology at uh, West Corporation. Um, my teams are focused on the digital transformation. We are supposed to uh, transform our legacy footprint and convert it into more of a platform as a service approach um, with microservice plat uh, patterns. Um, so over the last two years, I've been a change agent for um, a cultural transformation and agile transformation and now um, the entire platform transformation. Uh, most of our uh, projects are uh, based upon strangling some of our legacy technologies and converting them into much more newer things like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, um, microservices, and so on. Thanks. Glenn? Hi, I'm Glenn Donaldson from The Ohio State University. I'm in the CIO's office, so that's the central IT. We have a lot of uh, different ITs around the, the campus, as you know, 200 departments and so. But we manage most of the enterprise systems, student syst uh, finance, and HR. My team focuses on enterprise architecture, AppSec, DevOps, agility, uh, things like that. And the two, two projects that are relevant to the, this talk are the Workday project where we're ta taking all of our enterprise systems and going to Workday. So you definitely need integration being sexy as that, if you know what I mean. And then the other leading up to that is our integration platform, which we use WSO2, is that we've moved from using the base VMs to the uh, Kubernetes, Docker containers, et cetera. And we just went live with that in July or June and moved all of our customers to it. Alexi. Okay, uh, my name is Alexei. I'm from Align Technology, and I believe uh, there are people which use our products called Invisalign. Uh, so Invisalign is a very fast-growing company, and we are expanding dramatically, especially outside of the United States. And uh, we need to bring all our applications, our API, our systems uh, to emerging markets, especially in Asia Pacific and in China. And this is where. The team is focusing all the efforts for Agile to bring this. Brandon? Hello, everyone. I'm Brandon Walter. So I work for Cerner Corporation. We're a large healthcare IT company located in the Midwest, uh, about 27,000 associates. And I actually work in the internal IT part of Cerner. And one of the responsibilities that we have being an in internal IT is that we provide our enterprise applications back to the business to be used. And in all, this is an application portfolio of over 200 applications. About nine months ago, we did a large uh, reorg. And as part of that reorg, I was given an opportunity to lead an integrations team. Uh, that is a centralized integrations team. Uh, it's composed of, of four different teams, actually. And so as far as my contribution to 
the agile transformation in our organization, it's changed a lot over time, uh, but most recently in my new role, it initially started in, in trying to get that team uh, to develop an agile mindset uh, because I, I believe that agile above all else is a mindset. We're, we're going to talk a lot about you know, people and, and process and technology, but above else, I, I think the culture is a very important part of that. And so helping, helping those folks uh, develop that mindset because the majority of my team had not operated in an agile setting before. Uh, and then shortly after that, probably uh, three months following that, we were starting to get you know the hang of things a little bit. And that started to pivot toward more enterprise agility and helping my organization navigate things like microservices, containers, cloud. And we actually started uh, an API program, uh, again, with the intent of actually moving our enterprise toward enterprise agility. Yeah, great. So I, I would like to start with a little bit of a tricky question, but you can be honest. So the uh, keynote speakers, they talk about the um, integration agile. Uh, so uh, do you think that, do you see there's a need for your organization to move in that path? Uh, it's a two-fold question, actually. So uh, do you see a need? And then uh, if you have already started uh, moving in that direction, what are the steps that uh, you have taken? Probably, Brendan, you can start. Uh, yeah, so it's, that's a good question. Um, as far as the need, absolutely. In fact, agility was actually the catalyst for us creating our API program inside of our organization. Uh, the business wasn't really getting what they expected in, in terms of responsiveness from our organization. You know, our, we started to pull metrics and, and look at our dev cycle times, our, our lead times, even things like how quickly could you go out and find a service if one existed? And if you could find it, could you get access to it? Once you got access, could you go out and actually make a successful call? And so uh, there were a lot of things like that. We were getting a, a lot of feedback that actually uh, kind of led to us creating the API program and, and trying to manage to it. Um, I felt like there were some really great insights in the keynotes this morning. I'm particularly excited to take a closer look at some of the maturity models. We've actually, as part of our program, in the very early phases of that, we've probably been running for about six months. And as a part of that, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is kind of that maturity model. What does that look like? How do we help teams? Um, does everyone you know, need to get to the highest level of maturity? As we learned in, in the federal use cases uh, that uh, Paul was just sharing, we have some federal use cases as well, and so there, there's different barriers and constraints that, that we have to deal with. So I think that's that's one particular part, and then uh, the governance piece, right? Automating governance, I think that's brilliant. I think we definitely want to look uh, to make that as simple as possible, uh, and part of that, I think the value that you get out of that is that you take the human element out of governance, and because no one likes that governance, once you remove that human element and it's just a system telling you no, I think that kind of changes the perception of it. Okay. Alexi, how do you see it apply for Align Tech? Uh, for Align, uh, that was an uh, interesting question. Historically, Align was primarily focused on the US market. And uh, of course, we worked internationally in uh, Europe uh, and uh, even in Asia Pacific, but the business was very small. Therefore, most of the applications and systems were centralized. They worked in the local market where, uh, in the US, where we built our central systems, uh, our central identity management pieces, and uh, there was no necessity to be more agile because we have one system. But when we need to bring applications to regions, when we need to grow dramatically, when we need to comply with uh, local regulation or the special requirements like GDPR, how we bring the identities, how we bring, how we can regulate that, how we can govern the systems we deploy worldwide, and what are the processes we have in place to do that. So that was pretty challenging. So the team began to work on regionalization of our identity systems, uh, how to comply with those requirements, regionalization of our API gateways worldwide. And the uh, governance is the biggest part of, and compliance and governance is the biggest part of the transformation of the business get understanding this is not so small mm -hmm. it's big it's global we cannot operate or continue without the enough agility to continue to operate the same way 
in the 21st century. That was the biggest challenge for the club. And Blaine, any comments from you? <clears throat> um, yes, there is a definite need for Agile. Um, there is, we do have some pockets of the university doing Agile, but in the case of like the Workday Enterprise Project, they say they're doing project, I'm talking bad about them, but <laughs> I'm on the project too. So they're saying they're doing Agile because they're using the tools, but it's, it's like the mindset, like you were saying, changing that mindset of everyone on that enterprise project to think about the speed, the efficiency, the time to deliver, those kind of things while they're doing the effort as opposed to just playing lip service to agility. Um, where we come into play is because we're not that the center of excellence or whatever you want to call it, that integration silo, we are able to float between the different projects because integration is sexy. It's in between everything. Without it or the data, you just have a bunch of pretty UIs. So the f there's the fun in that, but yeah, at the same time, there's the agility and DevOps and things like that where that comes into play. Yeah. Also many feedback because I think I brief you about this stuff sometime back yeah. and you were very keen on uh, getting more details. So how do you see like uh, these uh, things apply for West and uh, your plans around that? Yeah, um, so full disclosure, um, since morning I've actually been geeking out about biology and cells, <laughs> and cell <laughs> membranes. Um, ever since Asanka told me, uh, told me about this, I've always been curious and I've been twisting his arm trying to get more information. Um, but um, I believe that biology will help drive a lot of these things. The fact is that even though we um, use a lot of technology and we adopt a lot of technology, at the end of the day we are all biological organisms. And so something that is reciprocated in biology um, feels right to us. And so these kinds of patterns, and we've seen this with like swamp technologies and ant farms and all these various things, they appeal to us much better. And so going down an approach to have integration, um, especially with an egress and an ingress um, um, integration is probably going to be very beneficial for us. Um, in addition to that, it helps classify the kinds of APIs and the, the classes of APIs that we're gonna generate because um, like, like Paul mentioned, we're having a huge number of API uh, of microservices being created. When how micro is micro, we we skipped milli uh, altogether. We we didn't go into milli services. We went directly to micro, and now we're talking nano services. Um, so, I think that would be really beneficial. Those were some very powerful um, things that um, I've enjoyed. Um, John also talked about um, the disparity between how the business interprets things from a value perspective and how uh, <coughs> developers look at things. Um, we practice something called agile engineering where we actually um, s don't expect the business folks to be agile, but we expect them to be lean. We want them to drive waste out of the processes and be mm -hmm. leaner, while our development community becomes much more agile and the way we interface with them is actually very similar to microservice patterns. I mean, they are producers and consumers, and so they don't need to know how the, how the sausage is made. They just consume. Um, so those are some really cool things that um, the keynote speakers talked about today. Yeah, great. And I'll uh, uh, go back to Gautam. I know you are an agile coach, uh, not only inside West, that you are running a number of uh, user groups in your area as well. Uh, so personally, I feel uh, the most challenging part is uh, converting the uh, people into a agile workforce or a digital workforce that they can be productive and then uh, continuously deliver these um, uh, products. So uh, what are the steps that you have taken and how you are transforming uh, your organization into a digital workforce? Um, so I think the most important thing that we have to do when we're going through a um, agile transformation is to make sure that it sustains. Um, and in order to have a culture that sustains and in order to transform the mindset, we need to appeal to people. And the most important thing is to um, impress upon them what exactly they are gaining out of it and why it's beneficial for them. Starting with why we are going through an agile transformation is probably the most important um, uh, information that we have to disseminate within the organization because it's, it's like how you treat a four-year-old. You can't say, listen to me because. Well, they're never gonna listen to you. 
Instead, if you say, these are the advantages that you get by being agile or by thinking with an agile framework, um, you will benefit your life, you will have more value add to yourself, you become much more lucrative in the industry, plus you become extremely nimble and you're open to experiment with a number of things. That's something that uh, we at West Corporation have been driving a lot. Um, so, like I said, we practice agile engineering, we do continuous experimentation, we do um, rapid prototyping, um, we continuously keep our developers in a state of discomfort, um, and we empower them to come and tell us when they start panicking, because mm -hmm. keeping developers in a level of discomfort helps them grow. Panicking just makes them write really bad code. Uh, <laughs> so we, we empower them, we identify the right change agents. We enable our change agents to actually have their own support forums and meetings and all that. We do not involve ourselves in those conversations because we know that each change agent will drive and translate at their particular level, rather than us talking from the ivory tower from up down and saying, thou shalt follow agile from tomorrow. That really doesn't work. Um, the other thing we do is we um, believe in fun. So we run a lot of fun-based activities. Um, we do team building exercises every Friday. It's mandatory. They must have fun. Um, <laughs> um, we, um, we, also kind of, uh, we also hosted our first hackathon. Um, this was a global event that we did. It was 48 hours of continuous coding, where we, um, we re removed the reins off everything and told them that these were the tool sets that you could use. And there were two alternates. One was using Pivotal's um, Cloud Foundry approach. Um, we, we, are, we are a big Pivotal shop. Um, and the other one was using traditional CI/CD tool sets using GitHub, Jenkins, Ansible, and Artifactory. Uh, we gave more points to people who learned PCF. And the way we did it was we gave them a two-hour video about what Pivotal Cloud Foundry was the Friday before, and that was it. But we allowed them to develop in everything that they could as long as it was legal and it didn't involve Bitcoin mining. Um, and it was fantastic. We had 26 teams that participated. Um, 17 of them completed, and we finally had around 630 check-ins within a 48-hour period, something mm -hmm. unheard of. And so continuously pushing people and encouraging them in a fun-filled environment is, is what we need to do. But the most important thing is, how do you sustain that culture within your organization? Because once you step away, they will go back to their old processes of agile, um, and we, we don't want to go down that route. So, so one uh, question like now, um, you are doing a transformation and changing the culture, but uh, you are trying to minimize the impact to the business by having an um, uh, innovation lab and then trying with different kind of processes as well as uh, different technologies. Uh, so can you share a little bit about sure. that? Um, we spun up, a, a, for the lack of a better term, an innovation center called RDX, which is Research, Development, and Experimentation. Um, the goal of this particular team is to try radical experimentation at extremely quick bursts. Um, we actually time box our experiments and we, are, and we pivot to persevere based upon um, what we want to do uh, at the end of that experiment. And usually the way it works is we take a business problem, we identify someone who's a champion of a business problem, and tie them with, with a developer for a short burst. Um, the iteration could last anything between one week to two weeks, and that's it. And the goal is they have to um, get to a business outcome at the end of two weeks. They have to deliver value. And so it's a quick burst of not only dopamine and endorphins, but also of collaboration, trust, execution, and camaraderie that we build. And it's a small unit that goes in, um, works on something, and then comes out. And whether we succeed or fail is immaterial. At the end of the day, we celebrate whatever we do, and we share, share that. Um, if it's a failure, especially, we share that openly um, with everyone because the failure of one team is learning, is validated learning for an entire organization. Um, so we encourage those. We have some really crazy innovation um, experiments that we've run. Um, they're not just in um, the microservices or platform transformation area. They're also around products. They're around pain points uh, because what we have identified is that a lot of people always rally around, around things that they hate, and they want to kill it. 
Yeah, great. Any feedback about uh, the culture transformation? Uh, any one of you want to share anything? You started by talking about sustainability, which is actually the eighth principle of Agile. So you used <laughs> a principle of Agile to define how your org is being Agile, and my head kind of exploded a little bit. I thought that was cool. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll uh, move to Glenn. Uh, so the keynote speakers, they uh, talk about how the center of excellence uh, grew, uh, teams uh, kind of pushing the agile teams back to fast waterfall uh, and waterfall kind of uh, uh, processes. So the, the, um, I know you have uh, overcome this situation by bringing DevOps uh, into development teams because the meaning of DevOps is part of development. So mm -hmm. you uh, kind of uh, brought everybody into the same team and then uh, managed to automate most of the stuff and then have a continuous delivery process inside the university. Uh, so can you share that story with us? Because it's uh, a very uh, interesting story as well as important for, I think, yeah, uh, What Asanka is mentioning is, um, I mentioned the enterprise integration platform that we stood up. But where it started was basically what I call Rogan context developers, or my people. Um, small team um, taking on, looking at integrations and saying, how do we solve this problem? and then experimenting and prototyping, you mentioned that kind of thing, just ourselves, but so solving those small, small projects that are big impact, so we could prove ourselves to our leadership and others around. So doing that helped them say, go forward with what you're doing and keep doing it. And then I was able to take those, that message around to our different teams like infrastructure, BI data warehouse, um, the department developers on campus and say, this is how we're doing integrations. Do you want to be a part of this? And so you find those people that are excited to have the passion around this work. And also why I say rogue in context is you're writing the lines of the rules. You're doing the right thing for your company or your university that may be against the grain or the rules or the old habits, the mindset that the folks have and keep on moving. So we've done that and I say that uh, our infrastructure, we started out with app dev, moving towards training those developers. I think you had, uh, John had the no code and low code folks in the integration platform and we did have WSO2 out there training We've done that, and now we have not only our application development teams doing integrations, we have our infrastructure, our BI and D data warehouse teams also joining the fold and seeing the value of the enterprise integration platform, as well as the enterprise project with his workday. No integrations are going to come to Ohio State without going through our platform. So we've come from a small, one the two man area to expanding and crossing teams to being in the middle of the work of our largest projects. Yeah. So DevOps is a, like a big part of this uh, uh, initiative. So uh, any feedback on how uh, your organizations uh, like having an improved DevOps process as well as bringing DevOps into uh, development? Uh, any feedback, Gautam, Alexi? Um, I, I guess I have a quick one. So in my experience, DevOps is always easier if you report up to the same mm -hmm. executive. Mm -hmm. uh, having that alignment makes sure that your goals are also aligned. Uh, in my particular case, uh, that is not how we are organizational aligned, but that doesn't mean that you can't do DevOps. Uh, some of the things that, that I've practiced with our ops teams, uh, one is, is being empathetic. No one likes getting woken up in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. uh, those guys do a lot uh, for the dev team in general, and, and sometimes uh, getting that visibility back uh, into the dev team helps the team be more empathetic as well. And we've also tried to include them in things and like team outings, have some fun with those guys, work on actually building the relationship, uh, and social lubricants never hurt either. Great. <laughs> Yeah. 
So uh, I'll move back to you. Uh, so you and the, your team uh, basically uh, working on a project to expose data as an API. Um, and uh, you guys are looking for different patterns, architecture patterns, and uh, kind of data warehouse 2.0 kind of a, a pattern. Uh, so how you are linking the APIs into the overall integration story uh, in the organization? Uh, so that's the first question. And then again, um, uh, since it's a new concept inside uh, CERN, uh, how we are evangelizing the UAPI program among the developers. Uh, so you can share some ideas. So first, in, in how to link them together, I, I feel like it's important to understand um, how, how we're kind of operating today and, and where we're at and how that inhibits our agility. So we are releasing code monthly. Uh, we actually sometimes more frequently than once a month. I think 1.8 was the last metric that I saw. And so that's kind of, you, know, you start to ask yourself a question, like, is it an actual mark or a number? And the answer is no, right? Because mm -hmm. Agile is a mindset. Um, one of the reasons why we do release monthly is because our organization is pretty tightly coupled. And so our ops folks that drive our deployments, they actually, they asked that of us because for them from a coordination perspective and trying to coordinate across releases with our project managers, it just became an impossible task due to just how tightly coupled all of our applications were across our portfolio. Uh, the, the second piece that's probably worth mentioning is, is that today we're a centralized integration team. And I was very excited to see this morning that in, uh, I think in all three keynotes, they actually talked about you know, the right model for that is, is to decentralize and to give all teams autonomy and, and have teams, you know, just because you're, you're an app team today, it, it, it's a good fit for you to be an app team and an integration team in the future. Um, in our particular case, that's, that's really challenging because a lot of our application developers actually just manage configurations and third-party tools. Um, so there's, there's some challenges and, and constraints uh, from that perspective. Um, we're also, because we were slow to deliver uh, in some people's minds or, or said no to the request or different things like that, uh, the business doesn't stop. The business is very creative and because Cerner is an IT company, we have very smart businesses. They have developers within their organizations as well. And so we actually ended up with a lot of point-to-point -point integration across our enterprise, um, which kind of speaks to how tightly coupled everything was before. And we still do have a relatively monolithic architecture today. And so when, when we think about the strategy, our, our strategy really is to, for me to shift my team from being the providers of those integrations to the enablers. I think that was almost verbatim what I, what I heard earlier. Um, and that helped me a lot just to, to be you know, self-assured that we actually are pursuing the right strategy. But our strategy does include you know, people, process, and technology. So, from a people perspective, we started to understand that you know, it's going to require a culture shift for somebody that just does app dev today to also take on that integration work in the future. Uh, so to your other question, we, we have been evangelizing internally. Um, sometimes that's, that's me or someone else on, on my team blogging about something and, and sharing some ideas and helping them understand how this world is going to pivot and why it needs to pivot. I think, uh, in addition, on the people side, we also need to make sure that it's part of our strategy to enable those resources. So we can't just right, hand them over the services. Uh, if you're the finance team and, and you do finance app development, I can't just hand you the finance integration services and expect for you to be successful. So we've recognized that you know, there's a lot of uh, frameworks and things like that resources that we need to be able to provide to other folks within the organization in order to make them successful, having office hours, different things like that. Uh, from a process perspective, one of the really cool things that we've done inside of our organization is that we came to the realization that IT resources are very difficult to come by. It's very difficult to grow our teams. Uh, IT organizations always have very tight budgets. And because of that, we started asking ourselves, well, how can we do more with less? And so we started looking at our development process and figuring out how can we gain additional efficiencies out of that. And so actually, top is down, we drove a CICD initiative inside of our organization that's been happening for about six months. We've seen some remarkable results. Uh, so essentially what they did is, is they built a maturity model 
that goes from level one to level five, and it spans continuous integration, automated delivery, uh, sorry, automated deployment, automated testing, and culture. So it's also got the people aspect associated to that. Uh, and because it has been driven tops down and it's been a priority for our organization, teams are excited about it, there's high visibility to it. Our VP, that is his number one goal, is to make sure that we're successful with that. And then from a technology perspective, uh, some of the things that we're doing, so we actually, we just went live with the WSO2 API manager. I actually gave, back to your evangelization question, I gave a, a talk at our internal conference that was very well received. A lot of people were really excited to be able to have a platform that can share, protect, and analyze our APIs. And then we're also looking at uh, platforms as a service. You mentioned Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, we're very interested in, in pursuing a, a platform like that and something that lends itself well to enabling developers to have autonomy and to also be successful with cloud native development. Okay. So Gautam, you have you are running two API programs, I believe, an external API program and an internal API right. program. So how you connect that layer to your integration layer as well as um, uh, the evangelizing any activities that you have uh, done on that side? Um, yeah. So so we've been a WSO two um, partner for over five years. More it's, than that. Yeah. yeah, it's more than <laughs> that, right? Um, at least I know of it for five years, probably six or seven. Um, it's, uh, I, I will say this, and um, um, I will say this with, this with the caveat that Asanka didn't pay me anything to say this. Um, <laughs> it has been one of our most stable platforms. It's, it's been phenomenal to work with WSO2. The amount of adoption rate has been quick. Endpoints work seamlessly. They're, they're easy. The patterns are quick. You can, you can deploy them fast. It's, it's been a pleasure to work with it. Um, we also started looking at other things like Apigee Edge. Um, so Apigee is, um, goes more in the, um, the busless kind of approach, and that is something that uh, platform as a service consumes, which is the Pivoted Cloud Foundry um, approach. So as we're strangling our platform, we are identifying the right patterns and the right technologies to use. And so everything cannot go onto a platform as a service. The maturity is just probably not available, or the technical cost or the cost to tra uh, transform a legacy application into a 12-factor app could probably be fiscally um, inhibitive. So um, what we've done is we have the legacy um, SOA stack with WSO2 that continues to help us. Um, and uh, we have a number of applications that reside on those and consume those on a daily basis. Um, but at the same time, as we go with Pivotal, uh, with Pivotal, we also have platform as a service. We consume Apigee. Um, some of the applications use both. And we have, um, so we have a diverse number of applications in a portfolio. We do conferencing and collaboration. We do E911, 1-800 um, numbers. And then we do notifications, uh, most of the text notifications. So there are a number of situations where um, one application in a portfolio of, say, conferencing will have to reach out to something in notifications. And that's when we write through Apigee, go to um, the SOA stack, and then try to use it. So that's where the internal and external proxy pa uh, pattern approach comes. Great. Um, so, Alex, this question is for you. Um, I think you are very uh, keen on getting your security architecture uh, done correctly, and I think we had a number of uh, whiteboard sessions uh, like discussing, discussing about the various um, uh, security patterns and then the usage scenarios and so forth. So the governance is one uh, uh, challenge in, with agility, and then uh, the security is the second part. Uh, so how you are handling this uh, and what kind of uh, uh, strategies that you have built to uh, overcome uh, that situation? Uh, first of all, <clears throat> we had initially, we started from the external APIs. We expected to have certain integrations with the third party partners, with uh, medical systems uh, to work with. and. Uh, Initially, we didn't thought that we haven't thought that we are going to use our own APIs in our internal network. Therefore, all our API gateways and identity systems were external. And I'm not sure, but I believe we were the first one who implemented uh, WSO2 uh, Kerberos integration to work for identity management for internal employees through Kerberos rather than through legacy LDAP protocols. Mm -hmm. 
okay, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little bit challenging because we, at that time, we had expertise in IT team for the identity system, but not enough expertise how to integrate from the R&D folks, from the developers. So they knew the system overall, the application they built, but they haven't had expertise how to integrate, how to make it work together. That was the first thing. The second thing is uh, how to bring integration expertise, the DevOps expertise. There are plenty of people which do that very well, but they are not developers, in spite of the fact they can develop the code. Therefore, we brought on board from DevOps team that knowledge, that expertise to IT organization, provided training for that. Also, we began to work with the security folks very tightly to review, is it what we are doing is the right approach from the governance, from the security perspective, by bringing application and segregating the API external from internal ones. And when started to work on the policies, who is going to build those policies? Who has the knowledge? So and leveraged a lot of the WS2 expertise, how to build that, how to go to regions, how to make sure that we comply with the local regulation, with the policies in various countries, especially the challenging ones such as China, Russia, Brazil, and Europe, GDPR. So uh, that required us to bring all the resources together to make sure that it's not some sort of the center of excellence when uh, initially, when you have monolithic application, developer dictate everything from the design till the integration. Well, how to connect that from infrastructure point of view? How to integrate it with existing SAP or Workday or other applications and systems? How to build the workflow? So that required to bring IT operations teams together, DevOps teams together, legal, security, to make sure that they built some sort of cells of knowledge in different areas and then start to communicate with each other efficiently. So the, first of all, it's a people. It's not the technology problem at all. Mostly, it's a people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I can remember like when we were discussing about your security architecture, like you were trying to tighten the security, same time you gave the priority for the end user experience, like how uh, people in different uh, geographies can have the same experience on uh, your platform. So that leads me to the uh, last question. So if you notice the, uh, the maturity model that we discussed, um, so we introduced the fourth dimension, so the people process um, technology, and we added uh, digital alignment to that. So um, how does that um, align with the organizations? Like are you uh, moving towards the digital strategy and then how you are planning to give a better digital experience for your end users? Um, any comments? So probably, Glenn, you can start. Uh. Um, sure. Um, my new focus or added focus is the digital business, digital transformation. And part of, uh, I'm one organization, um, Hi Ed Web, that focuses on the whole spectrum from communication, design, all that, and into the technology. And I bring that back to the university because we work with those that do the mobile applications, the uh, user interface, so t talking about universal search and being able to tap into all the different artifacts that are out there, whether it's documents or published doc or books or whether it's technology or code, having that user interface be available and look and act right for everyone, um, be accessible, things like that, tie into the integration and things we're doing because they need the data and how do you provide that data for those systems. So we're involved in that way. Great. Uh, Gautam, any feedback from you? Um, sure. So uh, a lot of our applications use APIs a lot. And uh, we touch a lot of customers within the US and globally. So for us, customer experience is one of the biggest things. We want to make sure that we, our products and our services are delightful to the people who are using it. Because uh, let's say, for some reason, you're going to 
call in to buy the Sunday ticket, uh, Sunday NFL ticket, or probably um, buy a movie while you're traveling. Um, you don't want the experience to be that you're hearing um, dead air or silence or all these various things. And sometimes the dead air comes in because the APIs or the integration points are uh, waiting for a response from something else and the orchestration is not elegant enough. And at that point, we have failed because we're not providing a delightful service to all our consumers. So, so we encourage um, all our development communities and our engineers and our, uh, and our operational folks to, to live that and breathe that and understand that they're actually impacting the life of someone. Uh, we, we carry E911. We don't want to have delays in E911. It, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a considerable amount of challenge trying to maintain um, all those integrations. And so driving that culture and that um, the value add that we are providing actually helps evangelize the way in which we design and we have patterns that will be fast responsive. Okay. So that's another question that I had, and but we can uh, give the audience uh, no time. Okay. <laughs> so oh, on the dot. Um, <laughs> I know we are, we are kind of cutting into lunch now. So who's hungry? Do you do you guys have some questions or? It's 12.30. Huh? All right. Um, well, I, I guess we'll stop yep. right now. Yeah. Um, these guys will be around um, for the rest of the three days, yep. I guess. Yep. So if you want to catch up with them mm -hmm. and ask any questions, you can always do so. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Feel free. Thanks. Thank you.